Before I get started, I just simply have to say this episode was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I cried at the end like a baby. Like, I'm so sad to see this series go. It was a tour de force in terms of animation and just the planning that needed to go into this series is on a level that I can only hope to see more of in the animation community. Like, the writers, the animation team, the, hell, the people who worked on the music, they all brought their A-game to this finale, and I have to say, they did a fantastic job. So if that's all you wanted from me, there you go. But if you want to see the full review, strap in, because this is going to be a long one. We start off with the fact that it is Webby's birthday, and they're celebrating at the fun zone of all places, and Webby is delighted, and everyone's there, Boyd, Manny, Gyro, Lena, Violet, Goslin, and I love the fact that you know, Lena helps out Violet to win over Dewey. We even see Feathery Duck there, which took me off guard. I'm like, man, we haven't seen Feathery Duck in a hot minute. We even get to see uh, Louie being proud of Webby because, you know, Webby so wanted to, like, go to a place like Funzo during the first episode. And here she is just scamming her way into getting some soda, like some free soda. And I love all of of this even Scrooge he paid out of pocket for this whole thing it's fantastic we even get to see that Huey is of course the organizer but it soon becomes clear that there's something deeper going on here also Gladstone just winning prizes with ease and Della and Donald struggling to win anything it's so on brand we even get to see that Daisy is here. Daisy's here! You know, it's Della really meeting Daisy for, like, the first real time. That one time with the gods and all that doesn't count. It doesn't count. We didn't get a true interaction there. But, you know, they're planning a trip that Feathery just kind of lets out of the bag that Donald was planning uh, basically just to get away for the most part. Just sail around with the daisy you know for who knows how long which really kind of hurts Della because that's her brother and she you know, just to have Donald up and leaving you now that they've finally been reunited after all this time it's pretty obvious that Della is kind of hurt by this and I can't blame her it's it's bittersweet moment also, Fenton, he's freaking out because he hasn't heard from Gandra in a hot minute, and he's worried that she might have been captured by Fowl. And at this moment where Drake is just still convinced that, oh, it's just like, you know, you don't have to worry about that, and, you know, we'll go in and save her because we're here for you, unlike that Gizmo Duck. He's not even here at the party. What kind of hero is that? Like, still keeping up the fact that he doesn't know that Fenton is Gizmo, which I'm just like, oh my god, I didn't realize that was still a thing. But the plan gets underway, and as the cake is brought out, we see that Fowl is monitoring all of this, questioning, like, this can't be right. They have to be up to something. No way they're over our evil lair, which Bradford would take offense to that, but their evil lair, and it's just like, okay, something is going on here. And as the Two of the three caballeros start to sing, Panjito and Jose. Oh, oh, so good to see this. I love this who's who of characters. You know, the operation commences as Boyd starts to take out the cameras as well as Goslin and Lena. And, you know, Black Karen asks what director Bradford would like to do, and he has a plan for this. As we get to see all of the main heroes heading into the ball pit, which, you know, they've 
somehow realize is the way into the secret lair of Fowl. And you, know, Lee, you would think Webby would be a little bit mad that they used her birthday as a cover, but it's just like a secret spy mission? Of course Webby's down for it as a birthday event. And we get to see that their party hats weren't hats at all. In fact, it was a map. As apparently Launchpad had been talking in his sleep, Double O Duck from all that time ago, when he figured out the machinations of Foul when he became super smart because of the Intel Array. You know, you know, that side of him was still trying to find a way to warn the McDuck family about the machinations of Foul. Apparently, Launchpad had been talking in his sleep, and because of that, Huey was able to, you know, figure something out through some kind of dream speak through Isabella Finch's journal or something like that, and he was able to figure out the layout of the Foul base. But we also get to see that Della is being a little bit of a brat with the whole situation going on with Donald. But that's neither here nor there. We get, uh, you know, Screw Team Scrooge, who's going to be taking down, um, going to be, no, uh, discovering the missing mysteries and all that good stuff. While Team Huey will be going after Fowl itself. You know, the head members of that. And as they head further in, alarms start to sound. Agent 22 is getting restless. You know, Miss Beakley does not want to be there when things go down. But Dewey actually kind of recognizes that from that same episode with Agent 00 Duck. Because he still kind of thinks it's a moment from the level that he was in. And they end up following him after they realize that he's right about a few things. As we see Gizmo, he is intent on finding Gandra and making sure that she is safe and okay. They run across that bubble thing from when they went to that island base that Black Heron was in charge of. And Huey handily defeats the thing. Love to see it. But... As Scrooge's team makes their way into the laboratory, Huey's team reaches the boardroom for Fowl, only to find that they've all disappeared. And they, uh, Scrooge's team has come across what looks to be clones of Webby. Dun, dun, dun! And they've brought them back to the McDuck Manor, where they're running tests to try to figure out who they are. As, you know, Della continues to try to persuade Donald to stay in Duckburg, as the girls introduce themselves as May and June. And, you know, Beakley is just having none of that. It's just like, okay, we need to find out who they are, what they are, what's going on here. Do not address them. Do not tell them anything. They're enemy combatants for all we know. And as Lena scans them, they realize, she realizes, oh, they're, yeah, they're Webby. They are indeed clones of Webby. You know, they are identical clones of Webby. Um, and while Huey tries to figure out what the purpose of this is, because he's just angry that their plan, the plan he made didn't work out, but they can't figure out why Fowl would make clones of Webby, and Beakley wants the children nowhere near these clones, feeling like it's too dangerous, but B Violet's just like, yeah, we're not gonna just let this go, we have to investigate, but Oddly enough, shockingly, Lena agrees with Beakley, as she doesn't want to lose her family or anything like that. Yep, there may be Webby's clones, but they're true sisters. So lovely. But, of course, Webby ends up sneaking off, and as Dewey wants to persuade Louie to go in on a new plan, Webby sneaks in and sneaks through the vents, you know, much to dismay of Louie and Dewey, who ultimately do nothing about it. And as May and June are locked in the closet, we have a similar encounter to the first episode where Webby came upon the boys when they were shut up in their room for the most part with some marbles. As May and June are overjoyed to be meeting Webby, who want to just find, feel like 
they are sisters for the most part. They feel like there's a bond there, which, you know, actually kind of makes Webby a little happy as she, you know, fe uh, she's always been this person who loves family so much. So, of course, the moment family is kind of brought into this, she's just all in. But Huey, on the other hand, he wants answers. He feels that they need to make it a top priority of finding out what these girls know. But Beakley is having none of it. She doesn't want anything to do with those girls. And I love how much Huey gets in Beakley's face because he's just like, no woman, we need to figure this out. But Beakley brushes this off. She's having none of it. As Webby shows the girls her room as well as her board and all that of the connections of the McDuck family. But uh, May and June drive home the fact that Webby isn't really a part of the McDuck family. You know, she, they're siblings, and they want to know more about their history and their family and all that. And uh, Webby ultimately reveals that she doesn't know much about her parents. You know, it never really came up. But, you know, May... Uh, really drives home the fact that they really should just look into their own family. These other people, they're not blood relatives, they're blood. And June even goes so far as to try to cut the thread connecting Webby to Violet and Lena. And Lena comes in and sees this and loses it, knocking uh, June across the room. And June runs out crying. And Webby berates Lena for this action, saying that, you know, while she does understand where Lena is coming from in not wanting, you know, weird clone business to end up hurting Webby, you know, Webby thinks that Lena should take it easy considering her own origins and all that kind of stuff. So she takes May and goes running after June. Um, Della continues to try to convince Donald that they need, they need to stick together, even trying to bring in the sword of Swanstantine to convince him. It's just like, yeah, bring out your inner strength. We'll go on an adventure. We'll do all that fun stuff. But Donald realizing that, you know, you need to get over this. It's just like, yes, we, I'll be away, but we're still family. We'll never be too far apart. That relationship that we have is never going going to disappear or anything like that. But as they walk out to buy some clothes for Donald's trip, Huey manages to spot June with the sword of Swanstantine, all aglow and all that good stuff. Meanwhile, Webby, you know, sees Mrs. Beakley and tells May to go after June while she stalls Mrs. Beakley. But it ends up becoming a very heated argument as Webby, you know, demands to basically just know what Fowl is after. And isn't too happy with Beakley barring her from this knowledge. But Beakley decides to just give some form of information on Webby's family, saying that ultimately her daughter, you know, she was, what was it, a baker or something? And uh, their, her son-in-law was an accountant, I think? Something along those lines. He had some kind of desk job. And she was off doing her secret agent stuff, and something happened, and they died, and, you know, she says that she didn't even know she had a granddaughter and all that, and she just, because of all that, she doesn't want to lose Webby in any degree. She's already lost so much, she doesn't want to lose a granddaughter. But as Huey tries to re relay what he learned to Louie, Dewey, and Webby, Webby's having none of it, not believing Huey that June would do something like that. Meanwhile, Agent 22 is ready to get back into the field, deciding to go off the grid and stop Fowl herself, despite the fact that Scrooge tries his best to talk to, you know, Beakley and just says, look, I made that mistake of not telling people what was going on in my life. Don't make the same mistake as I did. But Beakley ultimately knocks Scrooge out and goes about her business. Meanwhile, as Webby goes and meets up with May and June, she finds them 
stealing the last two of the uh, lost artifacts, the lost treasures, the Sword of Swanson Teen and the Blessed Bagpipes. And they revealed that ultimately this was all in an effort to bring these items back to Director Buzzard, who would tell them about what they were created for, essentially. And they want Webby to come along with them. But Webby doesn't want to betray her family, saying that it's not worth the risk. You know, it, they... Something like this isn't what she wants to do. So, May and June end up turning on Webby, with May taking the items and he meaning, heading to the rendezvous point with their foul contact, while June goes into pitch combat with Webby, e with June even downing the gummy bear potion, where she bounces here and there and everywhere and manages to apparently knock Webby out. Tying her up, they meet up with Don Carnage, who, you know, touches down outside of McDuck Manor. And Huey, once again, Huey really is the most observant person in this series, as he spots what's going on and infiltrates the airship as it takes off. But we end up seeing that this person in blue is, in fact, not June. No, Webby pulled the old switcheroo, to really wanting to find out more about her origin. Thus ending the first part titled, A Tale of Three Webbies. Ah, man. See, I didn't give that away at the first, just in case it was a bit of a spoiler, all things considered. But A Tale of Three Webbies, I love it. And it really kind of ties into something that, you know, we were introduced to um, in the original DuckTales, is that uh, Daisy had these nieces, April, May, and June. Um, these three nieces were actually combined together for DuckTales and made into the character of Webby. So it's interesting to see that kind of come into play again, but I... I was so blown away by this because it was just like the mystery of like, why would you make clones of Webby? What what deeper connection is there to all of this? You know, the intrigue here. Oh, it was fantastic. And I love what they did with the concept of April, May, and June. You know, the last time I saw these characters were in The, the Legend of the Three Caballeros, which they were cool characters, very smart, very intelligent, and very crafty, but they suffered from the triplet syndrome of all being the same. You know, May and June kind of come off a little bit similar, but it's very obvious that May is the more, you know, hard-headed and stupid stubborn and honestly kind of angry one of the girls and June a little bit more ditzy you know she's very quick to have these happier moments than uh June so it's an interesting contrast and it's not hard to too hard to tell them apart but I love this section and now it's time to move into Part two. Part two is the lost library of Isabella Finch. As we see Della and Donald returning from some shopping, where Donald has donned his iconic blue sailor uniform. I love that this is, you know, is his casual attire. You know, I love that fact. But in comes Louie and Dewey telling Donald that Scrooge had been knocked out, Agent 22 has gone rogue, uh, Huey has gone after, has gone missing as long as well as Webby and the two clone girls, because his um, Junior Woodchuck guidebook was left behind. And Donald, despite his reservations, has decided that it's time for one last adventure, as we see the Library of Alexandria, which is a very fabled library and actually the site of one of Karl Barks's stories as well the guardian of the lost library so i love that continuous continuous callbacks to the original ducktales mythos and webby can't help but just exclaim her excitement in seeing this almost giving herself away but 
as May goes to hand over the artifacts to Director Buzzard, he's actually not too happy with the state of Webby, ultimately having wanted Webby to have come along willingly, not against her will. But we have a little bit of a tussle between June and Webby, where it's revealed that Huey stowed away, but Director Buzzard manages to come aboard and spot this, with Huey acting as a hostage. And knowing that Huey is a junior woodchuck, Director Buzzard actually is interested in bringing Huey along. Meanwhile, we get to see the team of adults who are coming along on this ride with Scrooge, with the kids coming along as well. And while Scrooge at first bars their way, they all have their reasons for going, and ultimately even say that, hey, we're going to stow away regardless, so you, we, you can either plan things out with us, or we go in under your nose, and Scrooge ultimately relents. I love this show of just knowing how these tropes work. And Louie even manages to outdo Gyro because he has a phone tracker on app, so he's able to figure out where Huey is exactly. Meanwhile, at the library, we even have a moment where Huey is taken to Director Buzzard, and we find out that he is none other than the grandson of Isabella Finch, which explains so much about why he knew about this to begin with. It's just like, oh, Okay, that, like, so much is based around her journal, and Director Buzzard is so hell-bent on going after all of this, to have it be something where he is her, is her grandson, and that connection, it just blew my mind and to have him be a former junior woodchuck and he really does try to bond with Huey from here on out and it's just such a mind-blowing revelation I kudos to the writing team again just a wonderful interesting redirect meanwhile webby is still trying to make her way through the foul base and we come to find out that there are director buzzard clones apparently the other other buzzers that uh are around bradford most of the time are all clones having used the um the um that one gem of what's what that he used that in order to make clones of himself so very fascinating although the phantom blot isn't too thrilled with magical clones and um <laughs> i love this scene where all the bad guys are just sitting around hanging out eating snacks and stuff with webby even asking where the records room is very politely it's a nice moment and webby even locks away june for safekeeping meanwhile scrooge splits everyone up into two teams gold team which will be led by scrooge with the other adults and silver team which will be led by louie and dewey with the kids hanging back and eventually getting webby out and huey out of there but louie and dewey aren't quite sure especially dewey and louie even points this out it's just like louie's unsure louie that should tell you how deep we are in the shit on this one but scrooge gives a fantastic pep talk that louie can talk his way out of everything uh, almost anything and dewey has that boundless energy and that fearless nature that makes him a great adventurer they can do this. And so, Lena ends up clo cloaking the Sun Chaser, while the adults get off and parachute down. Everyone goes their separate ways, except for the original trio of Donald, Scrooge, and Della. Meanwhile, Manny and uh, Gyro end up making their way into the Relics Room, and end up coming face-to-face -face with the Phantom Blot and Pepper, with a captured Gene for good measure. <laughs> it's very weird that he has Gene just captured in this way, if nothing else. And we even get an explanation that the Phantom Blot has actually come after them to go after Manny, who is apparently the mythical headless man-horse of the apocalypse, which, I'm like, Yo, that's pretty dang on metal. And the Phantom Blot ends up using the Blessed Bagpipe to turn Manny's head to, to a living being, 
but the rest of his body remains stone, frozen in place. Very clever. We even get this weird team up between Gizmo, Duck, and Darkwing, and they end up coming face to face with Steelbeak. So he's ready to rumble. And I love that because Steelbeak is usually a Darkwing villain, so of course he would take on Darkwing, Gizmo, and Launchpad since they're Darkwing centralized characters. It's fantastic. And as the kids still remain cloaked, Violet starts to kind of freak out a little bit. So Lena tries to tell Louie, hey, maybe it's time for a pep top. But Louie's got a lot of nothing. But Dewey decides that he'll do things the way that his, that Scrooge, Della, and Donald would usually do it. And he decloaks the plane only for them to, and Lena is relieved by this because it was really kind of straining her. But they immediately come under attack by Don Garnage. Meanwhile, you know, as Bradford shows Huey around, he even shows him the first Junior Woodchuck guidebook and, you know, asks for Huey to hand over Isabella Finch's journal as it is the missing piece of the original um, guidebook. Apparently, Bradford had planted it for Scrooge to find so that he could locate something specific. As he feel, he admits to Huey that ultimately, all of Scrooge's adventuring has honestly caused more trouble than anything else. You know, shadow monsters, alien attacks, the loss of your mother. All of this can be traced back to Scrooge. Isn't that right? I love this sense of manipulation. It is fantastic and honestly it's true Huey is a thinker and honestly he is probably the closest to being just like Bradford it's a fascinating fascinating dichotomy and while Donald Scrooge and Della have managed to take down the eggheads they spot baby Jeeves only for Rocker Duck to come in with the fountain water of the forever glaze poured on Jeeves and he's back to his original buff Franken Jeeves form. Meanwhile, Webby has made her way into the records room where she finds out information about the creation of June and May, but not why they were made in the first place. She finds out how they were made using the stone of what's what and some DNA and all that good stuff and uh, the water from the fountain of the forever glaze in order to age them properly and all that good stuff. But anything related to her is unavailable. That is until she finds a file marked April, Project 87, 1987, the date of DuckTales. Oh, so cheeky. And she sees a security footage of Beakley raiding a foul facility and making off with something. But she ends up being spotted by Black Heron and May, who tell June, quote-unquote June, that they have one more opportunity to please Director Buzzard. And as the fight rages on between Steelbeak, Darkwing, and Gizmo Duck, he uses the Intellirite on himself, making him super smart with the ability to disable Fenton's Gizmo Duck suit, managing to lock them away in these weird prisons. And as Bradford continues to talk up Huey, he receives a phone call, and Huey spots uh gyro being led away by pepper so he follows and manages to find gandra d as well as none other than ludwig von drake my mind was blown i'm just like oh finally we found out if he was alive or not and gyro even asked the million dollar question how are you alive you were an old man in the 60s and the explanation is so fantastic where he's just like well bradford had me working so long and so hard i just kind of forgot like this man forgot to die how do you do that i love that explanation it is fantastic as Huey kind of questions the whole situation going on here, and, you know, uh, Ludwig explains that, yeah, all of this stuff that 
um, Bradford told you about trying to protect the world, yet no, he's looking to get rid of adventuring altogether. That's why he has the Lego circuit. He's trying to eliminate adventure. Yo, what the hell? Eliminate adventure as we see that he has locked up everyone who has ever been associated with Scrooge McDuck. Santa Claus, Pongito, Jose, Zeus, Celine, uh, Storkules, Thunderbeard, Goldie, Kit, and um, Rebecca, oh, no, Melissa? Oh god, well, I, I, I keep forgetting their names. The Cunningham girl. <laughs> like, you, they've locked away everyone. It is a sad state of affairs. As Bradford manages to spot Huey as well, locking him away too. Meanwhile, we get to see that Della's foot can turn into a tomahawk as well, which I'm like, yo, that is metal as hell. With Agent 22 coming in for the assist, with Rocker Duck fleeing in terror, but Beakley is none too pleased with Scrooge having infiltrated this facility as she wanted to be the one to take Fowl down. But because of their bickering, they don't notice the approaching May and Black Heron, with May knocking out Scrooge and and because of the fact that May looks so much like Webby, Agent 22 is unable to do anything as Beakley is taken down by Black Heron. Meanwhile, we get this awesome dog fight between uh, Dewey and Don Carnage. And Louis tells Dewey, look, we're not going to get out of this by you trying to be Scrooge or Della or Donald. You have to do it by being you. You need to just do it. And Dewey decides to play chicken with Don Carnage. And Don Carnage blinks first. But the two wings collide with the sun chaser and Don Carnage's plane going down. Meanwhile, we see that Black Heron is having June interrogate none other than Agent 22 with the Harp of Mervana. And, you know, Webby has the opportunity to ask Mrs. Beakley all that stuff that she would never admit to. And she's demanding it, and Beakley gives it willingly, saying that she ultimately found Webby in one of the pods of uh, Fowl. That's what she found. And once she saw this child, she ultimately took it in as her own, going to Scrooge for protection. Yes, Webby is a clone as well, which is just like, yep, they're all sisters. And it's so surreal. It's just like, you when you see triplets, you think, oh, clones. It's just it's freaky little clone children. But they're literal clones. It, it's a fascinating situation. And it makes me realize that feather that they got all that time ago, I thought it was Scrooge's. No, it was Webby's. So surreal. So odd. Webby is shocked by this revelation, as she wasn't expecting to find this out, and she's devastated that Beakley would keep this from her, and Beakley's mistrust of clones and all that, of course Webby ends up just hurt by everything going on here. But in comes Director Buzzard, saying that he won't lie to Webby the way that Beakley has, and as Webby as Beakley is led away, Bradford lets Webby know that if she cooperates with him, he'll tell her everything. And why they were created, why he created May and June as well, everything. And ultimately, Webby agrees, and Bradford welcomes back April into the family. And with that, we have le reached the last part. Tales end. The DuckTales end. Sad but true, but Dewey has managed to make a very Launchpad-esque landing, and it just costs little uh, Boyd his body. But Little Bub gives up its own body in order for Bo Boyd to keep moving forward. So everyone splits up into groups of two, and... Webby's none too pleased with the name April. She's Webby, and she doesn't plan on being anything else. But Bradford leads her to something I definitely wasn't expecting. 
back during the first adventure, Scrooge had made this claim to the Papyrus of Binding that it would only be found by Scrooge's heir. And it was at that point I realized why Webby was created. And as the words off of the Papyrus of Binding disappear, and Webby feels that she's no closer to finding out why she was made, Bradford just says, yeah, I made you to destroy Scrooge, and with this paper, you've helped me do it. It's... Webby is Scrooge's creation. He, she says, clone. Like, I'm sorry if that feels like I'm just outing a spoiler because it doesn't get revealed till later on down the line, but it's just like, it's obvious at this point, and I was blown away. It's just like all of this, all of this planning was just to get the Papyrus a binding. Webby's entire creation was to undo Scrooge on such a level. It, it was a masterstroke. Creating May and June was to get to Webby so that Webby would come to Bradford for answers. And using that need, she would, you know, find the papyrus of binding for him and unlock it so that he could have it in his own possession. It's fantastic. And as Scrooge wakes up from being knocked out, Bradford decides to have a little chat with him. You know, showing that all of his family has been captured and that no one's coming to save him. Meanwhile, as the Phantom Blot tries to siphon out the magic from Manny, in comes Lena with a devastating magical blast, knocking the Phantom Blot back and freeing Jin. <laughs> Jin the genie. And he just skedaddles. He's out of here. L Bye, Jin. It was nice seeing you. Yeah, that's his last appearance for this series. And as Lena frees Manny, uh, Lena tries her best to hold back the Phantom Blot. But Manny decides that it's finally time to embrace who he truly is. So he removes the McDuck head and rises like a gargoyle. You know, he we find out he's voiced by Keith David, the voice actor for Goliath from Gargoyles, and he screams out, I live It's just I no, I live again. Oh my god, it's such a moment. I was not expecting that, because that completes the Disney afternoon. DuckTales, Goof Troop, Gummy Bears, um, uh, Quack Pack, Gargoyles, Rescue Rangers. Did I, did I say Goof Troop? I'm going to say Goof Troop again, because I love Goof Troop. And it's just like, yo, that's how you worked in the Gargoyles reference. I don't know if this was planned from the start, but I love it. I love it. It. it is fantastic to have Manny, this character who we've known for so long, be this just ancient being and a reference to something so amazing. Meanwhile, Darkwing is still in the dark about Fenton being Gizmo Duck, but as Launchpad continues to get beaten down by Steelbeak, we have the incoming uh, Goslin and Boyd to help out. But Dewey and Louie end up seeing a marking made by Huey, and using the Junior Woodchuck guidebook, they're able to find Huey. And as they're released, and they get to just talk about the fact that Louie knows Huey so well that he was able to reference it in the Junior Goodchuck, Woodchuck uh, guidebook. Ooh, I talk good. And it's such a bit of character development, because Louie always looks down on Huey's tendency to use the guidebook, Louis actually got some use out of it. It's fantastic little bit of continuity. Unfortunately, they end up being ambushed by May and June. Bradford, meanwhile, continues to talk to Scrooge about how he was forced on these adventures by his grandmother, and he was never too happy going along with it. It cemented his idea that the world was full of chaos, and 
you know, he found that Scrooge, adventuring, magic, it, all these things had a tendency to lead to chaos, especially when they all came into contact with each other. You know, in the past 30 years, he has seen the rise of so many different things that have caused so many different problems in life. He just found that it was too much for the world to continue to take. And he had tried to rein in Scrooge with the suggestion that he might have killed off uh, Ducksworth, which completely took me off guard. But he's just like, he says it was in an effort to isolate Scrooge. I'm like... Yo, that's why Ducksworth died? That's dark. And they don't say it outright, but the implication is very, very heavy right there. But despite these efforts, Scrooge's family continued to grow. And that really round Bradford's gears. But before he can tell Scrooge the deal he wants to make, Scrooge manages to break free of his bindings and toss Bradford to the side, ready to take the buzzer down, only for Bradford to reveal that he has the sword of Swanstein, Swanstantine, and it reveals his inner self, which looks very villainous, if I may be honest. Meanwhile, May and June have tied up everyone who tried to escape, including Webby, much to the shock of the triplets who thought Webby would still be out there. And as Fenton gets a pep talk from Darkwing that, you know, despite the fact that he still doesn't know that Fenton is Gizmo Duck, you know, he feels that Fenton is being too hard on himself and that Fenton needs to just have more faith in his friends. So Fenton tells uh, Boyd to stop working on the lock and start working on the Gizmo Duck suit, unlocking it for a new user. As Steelbeak continues to deal with um, Launchpad and Goslin, he ends up showing off another ability of the Intelliray that he just gave it because of his super intelligence. The ability to make zombie slaves. And we see that he had captured Glomgold previously, as well as the Beagle Boys and Mama, Ma Beagle as well sending them into battle for them. But in comes Lena, Violet, and Manny to the rescue, only for a mind-controlled Magicka Dispel to lock them in one of the cages, as well as locking up Boyd and Goslin. But the Gizmo Duck suit has been unlocked, as Launchpad finds himself surrounded on all sides. But as the battle continues on between Scrooge and Bradford, Bradford tries to throw Scrooge off his game by saying that, hey, you ever wonder why Della knew about the Spear of Selene? Bradford was the one who let Della know about the Spear of Selene. I never would have guessed this. I swear with each revelation, Bradford becomes more and more of a maniacal genius because it's just like, yo, that is, that's, dot, you dotting a lot of I's and crossing a lot of T's right here. Like, man, that is some dark stuff. And of course, it sends Scrooge into a rage, but Bradford manages to get the upper hand, throwing Scrooge up to the roof where we see that he has created a nexus of sorts using the Selego circuit but in a way that is a little bit different than the last time with Taurus Bulba. No, with this one, instead of sending someone to a different reality, it erases them from reality completely. And <laughs> Black Heron, oh, I, I love Black Heron. I just have to say that right now. She looks at Bradford's new look and she's just like, hmm, looking a little villainous, if I do say so myself. But as Scrooge knows, it's just like, Bradford, if you were to get rid of adventuring, you'd have to get rid of your own people. They're just as predict unpredictable as I am. And Brad, you know, because, but, you know, Scrooge still believes that his family will come to save him, but, you know, we're even shown that, you know, all of his family has been captured. And it's only through 
who uh, an agreement with Bradford that they'll be able to be released. And the agreement will be signed on the Papyrus of Binding for Scrooge to give up adventuring, to never adventure again, because he ultimately feels that throwing Scrooge into the Salego circuit Somehow Scrooge will find a way back. That's just the kind of guy he is. But with this, Scrooge will be legally and magically bound to never adventure again. But, you know, I, I kind of jumped the gun. Where he brings up the fact that, you know, you'd have to do away with your own people. He gets rid of the his buzzard clones, which I think they were clones at least. But he does away with his partners, you know, getting rid of them and as well as Black Heron. And honestly, I was expecting Black Heron to be mad or scream in despair or something. No, she's just like, hey, nice, game recognizes game. You've truly become a villain. I am so sad to see Black Heron go out this way. It is a tragedy, because I really was digging this angle for her character and the relationship she has with Bradford. It is so fascinating, but bye-bye, Black Heron. You were oddly sexy. I'm just, just saying, just saying. And May and June are devastated as they considered Black Heron to be their mother. You know, ultimately she didn't see it that way, but they did, and they're devastated to lose her. But as, you know, Huey, Dewey, and Louie kind of discuss the fact that, wait, the Papyrus of Binding, how does he have that? We heard the story. It should only be able to be gotten by a relative of Scrooge. Well, an heir of Scrooge, and none of us got it. And Webby admits that she was the one who got it. And they realize, it's just like, wait, Ludwig von Drake, where did the DNA for Webby come from? And Ludwig is just very casually like, of Scrooge, of course. Like, he says it in a way of just like, yeah, if you haven't figured it out by now, it's pretty obvious. But it's a shocking revelation. But Webby is kind of filled with a lot of emotions here. It's just like, just finding out that she is, by all means, Scrooge's daughter, if nothing else. But, you know, May and June, they're at a loss. They've lost the only purpose that they had. To find out that they were only there just to destroy Scrooge McDuck's family? That's not a purpose. That, Not to mention, Bradford plans to get rid of them. Now that they know what they were created for, they're just going to be disposed of like a bunch of failures. But Webby says that they aren't failures. No, far from it. You know, and they, they're not alone. You know, just because their purpose wasn't something nice and cool and great grandiose doesn't mean that they're useless or pointless ultimately she says that family family is what you make of it it doesn't have to always come by blood it can sometimes just come by people who care about you and love you and she invites them to help save their family oof such a heart tugging moment Oh, so beautiful, so sweet. Meanwhile, as Launchpad is at a loss, feeling that he can't go on any longer against the villains, Darkwing and Fenton, they tell him, Look, we get it, man, but you can't give up. We believe in you, Launchpad. You might not feel that you're a hero, but you have the heart of a hero. You inspired me. And me. You know, they, they have this moment where everyone starts chiming in. Goslin and Boyd, uh, Captured Penumbra, the Rescue Rangers, Storkules, all these people. Th having seen what Launchpad was able to do, just having a little bit of faith in him. That he is a hero in and of his own right. And then Launchpad realizes the Gizmo Duck armor is ready for a new user. And so, he says the words, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, he doesn't quite get it, but <laughs> it's, it's close enough. And so, he dons the Gizmo Duck armor and manages to beat down most of the villains, scaring off Steelbeak, which shatters the Intelleray. 
and he even accidentally manages to free damn near everyone else. Meanwhile, Scrooge is doing his best to stall for time, but Bradford threatens to throw Donald into the Salego circuit, and Scrooge, without a second thought after that, signs away his ability to adventure. He is now bound to never adventure again. Bradford has won. But he decides to embrace in a little bit of villainy and drops Donald regardless. Now, let's be real. This would break the contract if he'd had fully gone through with it. Honestly, the contradiction alone should have broken the contract. Because, you know, he was going to end Donald's life. Donald is a part of Scrooge's family, and the terms of the contract was that if he wanted his family, he would have to give up adventuring. So, a bit of a contradiction here, and Bradford would have ultimately just put years of work to waste, but Donald manages to survive because the Salego circuit was turned off by the combined efforts of Gyro, Ludwig, and Gandra D. As Webby steps in to defend her dad, much to the shock of Scrooge. I love how shocked he is. It's fantastic. But, as he tries to get away from Bradford, he's bound in place. As everyone basically plays hot potato with the contract, as Bradford grows more and more villainous as time goes on, blaming them for turning him into this. But, uh... Uh, Beakley and Della, who have freed themselves from the change, tell him, hey, ultimately the sword of Swanstantine just shows your inner self, and if it looks like a villain, you just might be a villain, Bradford. But he continues to go on the attack, determined to end Scrooge here and now. But in comes that guy with all of that luck, no one but Donald Duck. And in an allusion to the first episode where they met again for the first time in years, they call to each other, Donald, Uncle Scrooge. It's, oof, that moment hit so good. So good. And, you know, we have Beakley, Della, Donald, Dewey, May, June, Webby, all stepping in to hold this thing back, to defend Scrooge as best they can. As Huey and Louie try to figure out a loophole, the genius and the swindler, and they manage to figure out a way around it, that it's flawed. But Bradford's just like, no, it can't be flawed. I worked on this for 30 years. Years. It can't be flawed, but there is a flaw, and in that, Scrooge's family is an adventure. He can't have one without the other. They will always adventure, because that's in the McDuck blood. That's in their blood. Adventure. You can't have one without the other. And thus, the contract disintegrates, much to the shock of Bradford who drops the Sword of Swanstantine. And so Scrooge is freed, Bradford is in utter dismay as he is presented with Scrooge's entire family, who he can always turn to no matter what. And, oddly enough, the villains as well, who very much look down upon Bradford, saying, Oh, so this is Scrooge's greatest nemesis. Oh, we are very much not impressed. But, still true to himself, Bradford continues to say that he is not a villain. And Magica yeah, agrees with this, as she turns him into a actual buzzard and even kind of claims him almost like a familiar as she pieces out with the rest of the villains as the heroes all cheer because they have saved the day they've won they've triumphed over the forces of foul and <laughs> funny enough scrooge has gained a daughter in the process which he wholeheartedly accepts Meanwhile, Beakley tries to leave, feeling that she really let Webby down in this situation, but Webby's not having it. She still wants to embrace all aspects of her family, as she wouldn't have it any other way. 
and thus the day is saved and everyone heads home on the very very rough looking sun chaser you know, Gandra D and Fenton Hat share a nice little moment. Darkwing is convinced that Launchpad was Gizmo Duck the entire time. Uh, Gyro restores Boyd's head to his body. Uh, May and June actually receive friendship bracelets from Lena and Violet, who question where they should go now, but in steps Donald, st st telling Daisy that they might have a couple of stowaways on their world-traveling adventure. I love that. I love that. that. That connection to Daisy, if nothing else, it's fabulous. It's fantastic. And we see Scrooge kind of taking a little bit of a overprotective nature to Webby now that he knows the connection that they share but the kids tell him hey we're smarter than smart smarties we're tougher than the toughies we see all the angles and we make it square we're the kids that you helped to raise and we are your family we understand it better than anyone and Scrooge ah, I love the pride he has in his eyes as Launchpad comes in for one great big hug who's flying the plane Launchpad well Della of course she steps in to fly this thing uh, as far as they can take it as Launchpad is relieved and leads on the Bombay doors on the um cargo bay doors unfortunately opening them up sending everyone flying out in a manner very similar to the poster for season three as we roll credits and when i tell you my tears started to flow at this moment knowing that was it this is the last send-off the last hurrah and it is beautifully done you know the smile that gyro has as boyd saves him with little bulb gandra d and fenton or should i say gizmo duck in this loving embrace you know huh, darkwing launchpad and goslin just soaring off um uh, and this 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 credit sequence destroyed me. You know, even having Lena, you know, using her powers to levitate Violet, May, and June, because it's just like they've created this new kind of friendship going on here. This bond, ah. Oh. <laughs> even this moment where Della is riding on the back of Manny, saving both, um, uh, uh, Agent 22, Miss Beakley, and Donald. Just, I love this way that Donald goes out. It's very on brand. And we get this wonderful parting shot of the triplets holding hands as they are in a skydiving formation. And then you get Webby and Scrooge in the mix as well. A last shot of Scrooge's lucky dime. And we end off seeing for the last time the Sun Chaser crash into the DuckTales logo, thus ending one of the greatest errors of cartoons imaginable. This was fantastic. I love this series from top to bottom, left to right, up and down. It was fantastic. It was an amazing adventure. And I'm sad to see it go, but I'm glad it got to end on its own terms and just got to do its own thing right up until the end. You know, it stuck to its guns and made it square. Uh, and I, I feel very fortunate to have watched this from beginning to end. I'm sorry to see it go, but better it end here than outstay its welcome, I guess. Though I would like one more adventure, just just one more adventure, that would quickly turn into 50 more adventures, but would that really be so bad? <sighs> Please, tell me your thoughts on this conclusion in the comment section below. What did you think about the revelation of Webby and May and June and April, honestly? Finding out about Manny and all that, Bradford's end, the end of 
foul in and of itself. Was there anything you were surprised by? Please let me know in the comments section below and share your love of DuckTales because I wouldn't have it any other way. And I hope you wouldn't either. Until next time, I've been Deuce Dizden, and I will see you in the next adventure. Bye-bye.